I want you to conjure an image in your mind. I want you to think of the person you love most in this world. It can be your mother, father, brother, husband, anyone whom you care deeply about. And I want you to vividly imagine walking up to this person and hearing them say, what was your name again? Do I know you? This, above all else, is the reality of Alzheimer's disease. Alzheimer's is a fatal neurodegenerative disorder characterized by the buildup of plaques and tangles in the brain, as pictured here. These plaques and tangles clog connections in the brain and cause people to lose their memory, lose their attention, lose orientation, lose everything that makes you, you. And I should mention that there's currently no cure for this disease. But I'm not here to give a depressing talk today. I want to tell you about how music, a seemingly unlikely treatment for anything, really, can alleviate some of the worst symptoms of this disease. Music therapy, as the name suggests, means using personalized music to improve human health. Today I'm going to focus on the two main categories of music therapy, active music therapy and receptive music therapy. Active music therapy really involves audience engagement. I sing and you sing. We all clap together, sing-alongs, call and response. There is no distinction between the performer and the audience because we're all making music together. Receptive music therapy is quite the opposite. It focuses more on instrumental music, often classical music, and it draws the listener inwards in a calm state of mind. Now, I first became interested in how music affects the brain about six years ago when I started playing music at nursing homes. I was around 12 at the time and a big Taylor Swift fan. So I would go to nursing homes with my friends and play songs by Taylor Swift and Coldplay. And while I really enjoyed that music, I could tell that my elderly audience wasn't really getting into it. <laughs> so we decided to add some older songs to our programs, songs like Edelweiss and This Land is Your Land. And the results were profound. People who could not even remember the names of their sons and their daughters could suddenly remember all of the lyrics to a song they had not heard in decades. So this got me thinking. What is it about this music that revitalizes the soul? How does different types of music therapy improve the cognition of Alzheimer's patients. So as many of you would do, I turned to Google for answers. <laughs> but surprisingly, I found none. At that time, six years ago, people had done studies on how music affects the cognition of autistic children, how music can alleviate depressive symptoms of Alzheimer's patients, a lot of related studies, but no one had directly answered my question. How do different types of music therapy improve the cognition, specifically, of Alzheimer's patients? So I took it upon myself to investigate. I, under the mentorship of a licensed music therapist, began a clinical study at a local nursing home to see how active music therapy and receptive music therapy improve the cognition of people with Alzheimer's. So this was a short-term study over 10 weeks, and week after week, I would go to the nursing home and perform live music therapy sessions with fellow student musicians. 
my patient population was divided up into three groups. The active musical task group, the receptive musical task group, and the combination group. And the names are quite self-explanatory. Before and after each music therapy session, I would administer something called the mini mental state examination. This is a short oral exam that assesses the overall cognition of a person with Alzheimer's disease. Now, I hypothesized that the combination group would experience the greatest increase in cognition because they would receive the respective benefits of both active and receptive music therapy. Active music therapy really gets patients excited and out of their sedentary lifestyle, while receptive music therapy can often quell nerves in people who are so agitated that they cannot remember their lives. So that's what I thought. I thought that the combination group would experience the greatest increase in cognition. But I was wrong. What I found was even more exciting. Let's take a look. So as you can see here, the active musical task group experienced the greatest increase in cognition. You can see the blue line is above 10%. While 10% might not look like a lot to you, to someone who's trying to get his life back, to a daughter whose mother has not remembered her name in years, that 10% means the entire world. Now, the mini mental state examination measures different aspects of cognition. One such aspect is orientation. A lot of nursing home residents don't know where they are. They get lost in a nursing home that they've been in for years. They think that they've traveled back in time and they're in the 60s. So orientation really improves quality of life. Recall is another way of saying short-term memory. And you can see there's above a 30% increase for the active musical task group. Language. This is a really poignant one because Alzheimer's disease can steal away someone's ability to say, I love you. Steal away someone's ability to remember their husband's name. So I was really happy that the active and combination group, as you can see here, experienced a great increase in their language abilities. And you can see across the board, all of the different aspects of cognition that improved in the active musical task group. Now, I think that the reason why the combination group did not do as well as I expected was the patients I worked with were in the middle to late stages of Alzheimer's disease. So they were already pretty steeped in their sedentary, repetitive lifestyle. And so they needed something that would not perpetuate the sedentary nature like receptive music therapy, but something that would lift them out of it, that would excite them and engage their minds, something like active music therapy. So the results of my study, now published, were meant to encourage organizations to apply targeted music therapy to improve the quality of life of Alzheimer's patients. I myself launched a nonprofit organization called Harmonies for the Elderly. This is an Austin, Texas based organization, and we started by playing music at nursing homes monthly. But this time, we did not play music by Taylor Swift and Coldplay. We played music that the elderly wanted, with special emphasis on active music therapy. And just recently, I launched the Vanderbilt chapter of Harmonies for the Elderly, and we have already had several concerts underway. In fact, there's one happening right now. So as I approach the end of my talk, I want you to think back to that person you love who cannot remember your name. I have seen hundreds of these people because every single person in a nursing home is someone's father, someone's mother, 
someone's son, someone's sister, and he might even be you. But again, I'm not here to depress you. So I want to tell you a short anecdote about a woman I encountered during one of my clinical trials. This woman was in the active musical task group, but she was having a particularly difficult day. She was not responding to her caretakers. She would not talk to me or answer any questions on the mini mental state examination. And even when I ended the music therapy session with her favorite song, You Are My Sunshine, she did not look up from the ground. So I was about to leave the room feeling pretty discouraged. But as I was about to exit, she slipped me a note. And the note read, you are my sunshine. So I want to leave you here with a piece of music. Because one day, not if, but when, you or someone else you know has Alzheimer's disease, you might struggle to remember what it means to be human under such duress. So here it is. This is the crux of humanity. Because what you feel right now when you listen to music might be the last thing you ever remember. And we want that memory to be beautiful. <laughs>